and we're targeting first generation students. These are people who are the first in their family to go to college and they're low income, they're Pell Grant students. And we work with them for the first year they're on campus. This is funded by a grant from the Department of Education. Uh, the program is called the FIPSI program. That's the Fund for the Improvement of Post-Secondary Education. And what we're trying to do, there's a federal program, a series of federal programs called TRIO programs. They include things like Educational Opportunity Program, very successful programs, but they're very, they only serve a small number of students. At Portland State, we have less than 300 students in our Educational Opportunity Program. But what we found, and some of this is fairly new information, 48% of our incoming freshmen are first generation. And because we graduate twice as many students as we take in as freshmen, that means we have a majority of our students who are transfer students. And Muriel, right? was that right? Okay, see, I didn't burn out all my brain cells. Okay, um, but if you work at the community college, you know nationally community colleges are 55, 53%. So I would say without exaggeration, Portland State is probably 50% first generation students. Now, give me back one slide. I wanna, I wanna plug this thing here. We are trying something, okay? What we were trying with this project is can we work with students, not as tutors, not as advisors, but helping them become more expert students? And I'll explain this as we go along. But unpacking the hidden part of being a successful college student. Okay, now, give me a slide. Okay, so I'll show you this model. It has my name on it, but that's okay anyway. Let's see the first one. This is a traditional model of education. Traditional model of education says a student comes into college with abilities. That's what determines whether they understand the course material or not. And we're going to see that manifest in their performances. Now, my colleague Dave Morgan and I said, I don't think this is really what's going on. I think ability actually has two parts to it. One is academic skill. The other is cultural capital in the form of understanding how the university works. And that can be everything but from how do I talk to the person who's teaching my class, to what are office hours, what's the syllabus. And you don't just need this, you need to be able to understand what's expected of you. And that could be anything from how to format a paper, to use the library. And what happens is when we see performance, we judge students on what they demonstrate, not what their actual capacity are. Is. So if a student really does not understand how the university works and they're smart enough to do good work, but they don't understand that if I say it's a six-page minimum paper and they decide to write a five-page paper, they don't understand that they're going to get marked down, or they don't understand that good students come to office hours, not people who are in trouble. While they think they're making informed choices, they're actually making repeatedly poor quality decisions that end up having them have poor outcomes and they think it's their fault. Okay, give me another slide. So when I call expertise development mentoring, what we're talking about are three big things. What do you need to do to be successful? I'm a pragmatist, not a moral pragmatist, but I'm a pragmatist philosopher like me to Dewey and those guys. I want to know, don't tell me to be responsible, show me how to be responsible. Don't tell me to be an engaged student, tell me what I need to do so that you'll recognize me as an engaged student. Insights into the culture of higher education. Students who are not familiar or don't come from a family that understands how higher ed works may make the wrong conclusions or attributions about what's happening. And then what we call tips on how to become more expert students. Okay. So this is our model. We believe that participating in the mentoring program improves their expertise, and improving their expertise should show up in academic performance and retention. This is all on the handout, but I've got this is now we got three full years, and we're going into the fourth year. We positive, participating in this program impacts first generation freshman retention. Between three, no, between four and eight percent 
higher retention rate for the students in this program than all Portland State freshmen for the first year. They earn higher grades, they complete more credits, which is a big deal in the literature right now, that the number of credits completed in the first year really determines success, and we can actually measure their level of expertise. So, I know we have a short time, so I'm going to jump now. Our next project is called the Students First Success System. This is Portland State has looked at the, at the research from the Department of Ed and say, you know what, it makes sense with our priorities. So the university, through our general education program, University Studies, myself and Dr. Steve Reeder, who is in Applied Linguistics, if you get the PSU Magazine, there was a recent article on Dr. Reeder about this learning web that he developed. We're taking this model that worked for first generation students and we said we're going to extend it to all incoming freshmen. So what are we doing with this? Okay, and, and eventually we're doing it with transfers also. The first thing we're going to do is we are going to identify potential issues that students are likely to encounter on their first year on campus. And that, click again, that happens here. Give me another slide, Carmen. Okay, I put time into this PowerPoint, it's got to work. <laughs> okay, this is a very simple phrase. Um, in fact, we may overuse it. New students don't know what they don't know. Okay, I know what I know. Some things I know that I don't know, but I don't know what I don't know. Okay, and that sounds like double talk. But what an expert can do that a novice can't do is they can look at a situation and they can see what are the opportunities. Opportunity, it's like, I use the analogy, go into a cocktail party where everybody else is networking and you're eating snacks, okay? I've been to some party where I'm standing next to the punch bowl because I don't know anybody there. Well, a novice is basically at the university's cocktail party and they don't know. They're eating the free snacks or they're looking out the window. So potential to get involved with key uh, interactions that could help you. And the other thing they can't figure out, what do I have to do now to not have problems in the future? So what we do is we are explicit. This is what you need to do to read for success at college. This is what you need to do to understand a syllabus. This is how you manage financial aid. We do not assume, we don't insult anyone, but we do not assume that everyone knows this, but we do assume that they probably are too shy to admit it, okay? The next thing we do is we try to give them tools to connect them with a range of available campus resources. This is a big deal for new high, sc high school to college and from community college to college. Even at a community college, resources are clustered, and there are people out in the halls who are trying to pull you in. I say to the students in my program, there are people who want to help you, but they have short arms. So my job is to push you within their realm, okay? And one of the things that we do in terms of tools is we use online resources. This is another thing that I was able to show from my Department of Ed project we were able to run an experiment and show that online delivery of mentoring, if it's done in the right way, can actually be effective. So let's see where this happens. Again, again, yeah. So, <clears throat> I mean, I'm not going to have lots of time, but it's important to understand that this issue involves interventions on both sides of, this is interpretation. What are the issues? What are the resources? Okay, give me the last one. Third, we give them scripts for how to use campus resources appropriately. This is something that really kind of goes back to that pragmatist philosophy about showing people how to do. I will argue that it's not enough to tell somebody where the writing center is located or even what they do. I even need to tell them how do you sign in or make an appointment, okay? Because they don't know um, that if you are with five minutes late for an appointment, they'll give your slot away, okay? So I could have really good intentions and I could have talked to somebody who says, now Pete, get help with writing and I make the appointment and then like my, my Samoan friends, I work on island time or something like that, I come 10 or 15 minutes late, you know, and all of a sudden I don't have an appointment, okay? 
So bing, 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 three, okay, very good. Let's see what else we got. So, give me another slide. This is the website. I know that we, you're gonna wanna ask questions, but please check this out. This is now the site where we are only focusing on expertise. There's no longer mention of first generation students. You will find video clips embedded on this page where successful Portland State students, let's say if we're talking about dealing with a big campus, there'll be a 40 second or a minute and 10 second video clip where a real student looks into the camera and tells you about their issues. Okay, so implications, I'm wailing. <laughs> First of all, I got three, because I want to answer questions. I know you're on a time thing. We need to be more explicit in conveying our expectations and what the culture of higher education is to students. I'll give you a quick story. When I started this, I was working with our educational opportunity program and a student had been told, first generation student, go talk to your professor at the beginning of class. So he waits his turn, female, young female professor. He goes up, he's gonna use the most polite term he can think of. Excuse me, Ms. Jones. And she says, that's Dr. Jones. And he doesn't ask another question for the rest of the term. Now, when I told that to my group of students in orientation, they said, well, yeah, well, she's a jerk. I said, but see, what you don't understand is that there's a lot of sexism in higher education and that female professors, particularly young female professors, find that if they don't use their title, they are not treated with respect by certain male students. Okay, I don't have that problem. Right? But it's not that I'm a nice guy because you can call me Collier and she's a jerk because she says Dr. Jones. The deal is, if you don't know that even in higher education, sexism is still around, you could misinterpret her response as she doesn't care about me. And that's wrong. So if we can make that explicit, at least, I even give students a card that tells them, call everybody doctor or professor. The worst that happens is the person goes, oh, I'm a graduate student, no, it's okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Expertise development mentoring works. That's what this is about. We're trying to figure out, can we deliver something that is not as high cost as the federal programs that only cover certain things. I'm not able to help people who are academically behind in certain areas. But simply by making people aware of issues, giving them strategies, telling them what's on campus, and actually showing them how to use it and when to use it, that has an effect. And the other piece that these projects <coughs> seem to be showing is that on online delivery of student support services or resources actually can prom promote retention and success. So where we are right now, that website is now in place to, for all the freshmen to work on. That's called our presentation site. We also have a working site where a group of 25 people on campus are able to come in and edit our, our sites. We are adding materials. We are creating new materials. I'm also developing materials for transfer students. And we should, um, we're going to incorporate this uh, online self-directed learning software program next year, but I'm hoping in a couple of years to have some results about how this might have positive effect on our incoming freshmen. So I got one more slide. This is our hero, Vincent Tinto, who's a big person in the, in the literature on access. Access without support is not opportunity. And this is really timely with that 40-40-20 thing that's out there that we want to get higher percentages of our students into higher education. Access is not enough. Access is not enough. We need to figure out how we can develop support, particularly in this financial climate, that will have some of the mediating effects that we do with other mentoring. And with that, I will be happy to answer questions. Was it uh, your department that put this article in our packet? It wasn't my department, but that was me that talked about it. And, uh, okay, but there's, I had a problem with some of the statistics. I didn't uh, provide the statistics. I don't know what they, because what. Because they, they say that uh, Portland State had 
348 dropouts, and that was 30 percent. So that meant there was 1,160 freshmen that year. For the University of Oregon, it says they had 458 uh, dropouts, and which was 15 percent. That would meant that they would have to have 3,053 freshmen that year. And, and there's no way that in 65, University of Oregon had three times the number. It seems to me that's a little low. The last ones that I saw for most six oh seven, maybe a seven eight, was about fifteen hundred. But U of O does have tw at least twice as many students in their freshman class, and yet we have almost as many students as they do, or we have more undergraduate students, and the reason is because we get a very high percentage of our students from community colleges. Yeah. That the the other piece that I would say is because I am a measurement guy, I, I would say that that 1,080 students probably did not represent all of them. It may have only been people that they had certain kind of identifying data on, but um, I'm pretty sure the last numbers I saw were incoming classes between 15 and 1,600. So, yes, sir? How much impact do you think you're going to be able to have on retention? Okay. I... Uh, I, I'd be happy having two or three percent, okay? Well, here's what I figured. If I could do for Portland State's freshmen what we did with our students, four percent of 1,500 is 60 students. It costs the university $5,000 for every freshman who starts and drops out in the first year. Five times 60 is 3,000, 300,000, okay? And one year we had almost eight percent. I would be supremely happy if I could get two or three percent improvement in retention. The other piece that we found is I've got a second grant where we're looking at what's called persistence of effect and the students who participate in this program continue to show this positive effect over time. Um, but I'm a realist and I think, I think if we could, you know, we take what we can, this will not make up for uneven K through 12 education. It will not. It will not deal with any of that kind of stuff, but this is, do, this is something I can impact. That's why I did that. Anybody else? So, you well, you have so many students who are not freshmen. Yeah. Uh, who are passing through doing this and doing that. Yeah. I have, but I, I, I only showed you my freshman data. We work with transfer students. What I find is transfer students do not drop out. But transfer students' issues are about efficiency and effectiveness. Can they get through in the shortest time? And can they make the best of the time that's here? If I come in with only two years left in my degree, how do I get the quality of recommendation letter that I need to get into a graduate program? Or how do I get, how do I get a professor to know me well enough? So we found that we could impact transfer students and Right now, we're piloting a kind of a universal transfer class that everyone has to take, and I am using some of this transfer material. Transfer from another institution. Yeah, transfer from another institution okay. to Portland State. Because the objective of a lot of people is knowledge or job, not degree. Mm, I think that the, you know, um, I'm thinking in particular of the research that's being done at UCLA by Alexander and Sandy Aston and how students motivations have changed but I think if people want a do people want a job they're finding unfortunately the credentials are being used as a gatekeeper not that we're not we're not doing skill tests so um, I'm kinda hoping you know this may sound really pretzel logic I'm hoping that with the, how serious it's going to be for people to go to school and the cost that we might actually see more, um, particularly of our young students, kind of realize how important it is. Because I talk, I talk as common as I can without being crude, okay? <laughs> You know, so I mean, I tell people, I, I even, they even joke about what I write on my pages. I say, nobody's going to open the top of your head and pour the knowledge in. Or, you know, if you don't go to class, it's like shooting yourself in the foot or throwing your money away. But somehow, we've got to go from the language that is so embedded in our bureaucracies down to something that an 18-year-old 
will, will deal with. I just have translated the student conduct code. Our conduct code is 25 pages long. But you can sum it up, you know, plagiarism and dishonesty will result in these kind of consequences. You can't carry a handgun on the Oregon State, any kind of Oregon campus, even with a concealed permit, unless you have, I mean, we can spell it out. You get into trouble with alcohol and you're underage in the dorms, you'll lose, you'll lose your privileges. They'll kick you out. Or you can't, you can't use PSU computers to pirate videos. But I understand that the lawyers wrote the con conduct code for one reason, but if we're trying to reach the student, it's got to be taken down to a, I hate to call it sound bites, but something that people will relate to. So I don't know if I answered your question. I'll just go off crazy. Yeah. I was just curious if your research into um, is going to be used nationally or? Well, um, I gave the keynote address at a state retention summit in Minnesota. Part of my Department of Education grant is dissemination. We presented in multiple places. What we're looking at now is the creation of an institute, perhaps on campus, where we could share the knowledge, um, tell people, show people how to do expertise development mentoring, because all of this won't transfer to another school. It's, this is written in, in specifics for this institution but probably 60% of it might, you know, and, and instead of doing one project here, another one in Minnesota or somewhere else, can we have a place where we could do workshops where we could kind of pass this stuff on? So yes, we're hoping, and I mean, this is a tremendous opportunity for Portland State to say we're going to invest in this, and, and um, I'm hoping to show uh, if we're successful on this level of scale, then that we could try. I mean, I presented to OUS subcommittee on retention twice this last year. Um, would seem like it'd be smart if the university system watched and saw if this worked, they might consider it would be a good investment. We can do one more. One more, okay. Oh, uh, thinking of Sarah Phelan's academic record. Do you happen to know if she's a first generation college student? I do not. I do not. <laughs> I know our provost is a first generation college student. <laughs> and. I don't want to, I do not claim this is because of what we're doing, but I hear more people who are talking about it and acknowledging it. The first time I started talking about this, people thought I was dealing with immigration. They thought I was talking about the children of immigrants as being first generation. And a lot of students don't realize, why should I feel like I'm at a disadvantage because I'm first generation? And I'm, you're on a time loop, right? Okay. You know, yes. Just maybe just as a statement of support for your for your last comment. You know, the state of Oregon population of students going through K twelve is becoming more and more like PSU's population, and so I think in terms of first generation, all the other issues, the work that you're doing, as you say, maybe sixty percent PSU language, mm -hmm. but schools that have had more sort of what that sort of traditional group of students are really going to have to learn from us how to manage the new generation of students who are going to be coming through Oregon in the next 20 years. And I know you all here, every place you go, everybody tells you how great we are, but this Considering how scarce resources are, I am, I feel really lucky to be here at Portland State where they're willing to invest in the general education program. We are, we have a lot of things that, that we're trying to do and so um, I just appreciate the chance to tell you about what I'm doing.